these developments, right? This Hamilton play that we talk about in our book, and I know our next guest has, has spoken about as well. Uh, we have uh, this kind of liberal orientation to racism, a really res a response to the movement to keep things stable. Uh, but they've gotten ahead, and our next guest will talk about this. They've gotten ahead of a lot of the left, a lot of those professing class struggle in mm -hmm. talking about racism, talking about white supremacy. But it's July 4th, and we cannot avoid it any longer, and we definitely cannot avoid it on this day. So I want to bring on our next guest because white supremacy is so important to understand, and I don't think there's really anyone else better to understand it. So he is already here. Dr. Horn, thank you so much for joining me today. I love your work. Um, uh, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so, you know, you are the author of more than 30 books. One of my favorite books actually is The Counter-Revolution of 1776, Slave Resistance and the Origins of the United States of America. And it is July 4th. And July 4th is the a national celebration of the founding of the United States, this Declaration of Independence, which a lot of people claim is a celebration of the quote unquote liberties and the freedoms and the quote unquote democracy that the United States represents. But you have made an argument that has gotten a lot of backlash from even so-called far left circles, socialists, people who call themselves communists, uh, that claim that what you are doing is actually degrading the founding fathers and that your argument that the United States, the very formation of it was a response to an incipient trend towards abolition is uh, completely an affront to this bourgeois revolution that we should be celebrating, this freedom from the monarchy, which unleashed capitalism and created a progressive uh, force in the United States. I think that this is a myth of American exceptionalism myself, because I think the reality of what we're living in, the fact that racism and white supremacy is very much with us and completely shapes material conditions in the United States, especially for Black people and our indigenous um, brothers, sisters, and others. So could you go over this argument for us that you have made? and? Um, could you counter this? Because I think that you have such a sharp grasp on history that, um, and in a history that isn't really taught in schools at all, um, when the counter argument to you, what you're, uh, what you write about is, I think really what's just taught generally in textbooks with a kind of socialist veneer over it. So could you go over your argument of why the United States' formation is a counter revolution, why it's so important to understand this on July 4th? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, second of all, you anticipated the part of the thesis I put forth in suggesting that uh, July 4th, 1776 marks a council revolution, not only against an incipient trend of abolitionism in London, as represented by Somerset's case, June 1772, where Lord Mansfield suggested that uh, slavery would no longer obtain in England. There's a uh, justifiable apprehension that that decision would leapfrog the Atlantic and jeopardize slave fortunes of a murderous row of so-called founding fathers, including Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Patrick Henry, lawyers for slave owners like John Adams. And some of the critics, when they look at abolitionism, they don't look at, <laughs> at the enslaved as being the abolitionists. They only look at people like themselves. And then they say, well, we don't. We didn't see any abolitionist trend erupting in London. Well, you know, you, you need to look in Jamaica. You need to look at Barbados. You need to look at Antigua, uh, for example, where the settlers were not only running the risk of uh, losing their lives because of slave revolts, but more importantly to them, uh, losing their investments as well, which happened finally in what we call Haiti between 1791 and 1804, uh, which hit the settler class, not least in North America, with the force of a category five hurricane. You should also know that uh, it's not only labor that's at issue. And interestingly enough, the so-called materialists, when it comes to looking at North America, 
Uh, they throw materialism in, into the dustbin uh, because when you have the breaking of the law, which is basically what these settlers in North America did, there must be powerful material reasons. One, of course, is slavery. The other is land. And in 1762, 1763, there was the Royal Proclamation where London expressed uh, reserve, shall we say, at continuing to wage war against Native Americans, pushing west across the continent so that land speculators, real estate speculators, like the precursor of the most recent real estate speculator, speaking of Donald Trump, now speaking of George Washington, uh, could profit handsomely. Part of the problem with regard to historians, and particularly U.S. historians, is that many of them, they'll parachute into 1750 and pick up the story there, which is like coming into the movie in the middle of the plot and thinking that you grasp everything that has happened before, or as I've written previously, it reminds me of the jury in the first Rodney King case. Recall that Rodney King was the black motorist in the early 1990s. He was, his beating savagely by officers of the law was captured on tape. That became evidence in the trial of the officers of the, of the law. Uh, his, the officer's defense attorneys uh, rather slyly would only show snippets of the tape and therefore not a continuous loop and the credulous jury would be asked, do you see any violation with regard to this snippet? Well, no. Maybe you know the officer just has his hand in the air and doesn't show him cracking down on Rodney King's skull. And of course, uh, the officers were acquitted and Los Angeles went up in flames. Well, see, this is part of the problem with uh, these historians in the United States. Now, it may be due to the repression that has been suffered by people in the United States. It may be due to the fact that people like me were barred from archives until quite recently. But in any case, you rarely have these historians go before 1750, even though English settlement, as we know, starts in 1607. And then, as you know, in history, part of the, the issue in history is asking the right questions. One of the questions you should ask is Spain had the first mover's advantage. After all, they sponsored Columbus in 1492. So how was it that it was London that is able to sail into what they call Virginia after the so-called Virgin Queen in 1607? And that's dealt with in my 16th century book, where I point out that Spain had established a settlement in what is now St. Augustine, Florida, as early as 1565 which of course calls into question the mythos of 1619. But in any case, uh, they spent so much time battling the enslaved Africans who were there from the inception, not to mention the indigenous, that they wanted to confront the English as they sail into what they call Virginia in 1607, but they were too tied down fighting the indigenous and the Africans. Which brings me to my next point, which is that Spain had a religious qualification for settlement. You had to be Catholic. You had to be religiously correct. You could be an African and be a conquistador as the example of Cuba uh, helps to illustrate. London adopts the Protestant uh, faith, if you like, as early as the 1530s, which unleashes a round robin of religious conflicts in order to gain a seat at the banquet of colonial plunder, uh, London was not able to have religion as a qualifier, being Protestant as a qualifier. There, there weren't that many of them early on. And so they co-opt those with whom they had been warring for centuries, the Irish, the Scots, the Welsh, and from there move from religion to race as a qualifier, which is where we're stuck today. So I understand why there are so many particularly amongst the Euro-American community uh, who celebrate July 4th, because uh, it would be foolish to deny that those who had been persecuted on the shores of Europe, the Jewish population, the Catholic population, etc., they found a refuge and a sanctuary in North America. They left out the other half of the equation, which is that there were those, such as my ancestors and the ancestors of the indigenous, who found no refuge, 
And in fact, like a seesaw, as these European invaders went up, we went down. And that's the sad and tragic story of 1776, a sad denouement, which we're still reenacting, I'm afraid to say, in 2021. But I'm happy to say that increasingly, you have a core of Black scholars and Black creators who are challenging the creation myth. Just as you pointed out in your opening remarks, uh, you, it's not necessarily all coming from the poor and disen disenfranchised in the Black community. I'm thinking of the filmmaker Raoul Peck of Haitian origins and his spectacular four-part documentary series, Exterminate All the Brutes, a sweeping castigation come analysis of settler colonialism, a term conspicuously missing from the ordinary vocabularies of many on the left. Uh, you wonder, I mean, they use it with regard to Israel and Palestine. I mean, you had European invaders who came and ousted the indigenous. I mean, isn't that settler colonialism? I mean, come on. And of course, there is the book by the scholar Tyler Stovall, White Freedom, uh, which critiques not only 1776, but the entire Enlightenment so-called project and then, of course, there's a notorious 1619 project out of the New York Times. And, of course, there is Ishmael Reed, the paramount black intellectual of Oakland, uh, who did this spoof of the Manuel Miranda extravaganza, Disney come Broadway extravaganza, Hamilton, where he points out the reality with regard to Hamilton marrying into a slaveholder's family. So I dare say that this mythology of 1776 is now on the ropes, certainly it will not survive this century. And it may not even survive this decade. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, exactly. You know, what you're saying is so critical because how I see it, uh, is there is there an um, echo? I don't know. Maybe I can mute you. Hold on one second. Sorry, Gerald. Um, so... It's so important what you say, uh, Dr. Horn, because settler colonialism, white supremacy, it is not being talked about in relations to this, not only this day, but I think just how we orient ourselves in this struggle, right? This struggle against the U.S. power structure, capitalism, imperialism. And what I find so troubling is that when there are expressions of black self-determination, like what we saw in 2020, this last year, um, into this year with the historic protests against racist policing, uh, what we have experienced all, since 2014 in the death, in the vicious uh, lynching of Michael Brown, we often are just having these debates where we even just have to introduce the idea of self-determination and settler colonialism, these terms that you're speaking of, just into the debate. And, and we have to start from scratch. I feel like that's where we often are starting. You wrote a great piece recently, actually, um, that was republished by the Monthly Review against, um, um, hold on one second. Uh, remind me of the title of your recent piece. Against left-wing nationalism, that one? Yes, exactly. Left-wing um, white nationalism, excuse yes, me. Yes, well, <laughs> which, was incredible uh, because, I mean, it's saying everything that I think we have like a gender report are thinking all of the time when it comes to how races and white supremacy is ignored. But the the present experience of Black people in this country is bearing fruit. The majority of the world is uh, experiencing white supremacy on a global scale, and so I would, you know, I want you to, if you could, give us a picture of what you write a lot about, which is the role of Africans, the role of the enslaved in pushing history forward um, in the colonial context of the mainland colonies, because the breakaway from Britain is often just viewed as the colonists were sick of tyranny from the motherland, right? And that was it. But yet there were all of these rebellions that were happening. And you um, uh, put up a, a very good argument that Africans en masse, the vast majority of them, the enslaved, were siding with the British. And that there were cases in Florida, in Spanish uh, co colonized Florida, where Africans were 
being armed and they were throttling South, you know, South Carolina, for example. Um, could you speak to this in, in, in some detail for us? Because I think it's so important. And then how does it relate to the current historic experience of, of Black people in the United States? Well, you're raising a number of points. With regard to the revolt south of the Canadian border against British rule, once again, people need to ask the question, well, why didn't Canada revolt, for example? And particularly since you obviously have this restive population in Quebec, uh, it was restive in the 18th century, it's restive today. And you know them by their fruits, by their, their fruits you shall know them. And so why is it that the so-called revolutionary republic established post-1776 uh, has a pay or die system with regard to healthcare, whereas we can only dream at this point about the single payer healthcare system uh, that uh, people in Canada uh, enjoy? Shouldn't it be the other way around? I mean, shouldn't the so-called revolutionary republic have the social welfare benefits? Isn't that what revolution is all about? Bettering the lives of the masses? But of course, we, we know that the vaunted Constitution and Bill of Rights did not apply to the African population nor the indigenous population. Take the vaunted Second Amendment, for example, the right to bear arms. The Second Amendment, boys and girls, did not apply to Native Americans and to Black people. Because if it did, the regime would have been overthrown. That is to say, the slave regime in particular, well before 1865, believe me. Likewise, you could even make an argument as a person who used to be a lawyer, that the you could make an argument that the Constitution pre-1865, in a sense, only applies in Washington, D.C., because the United States pre-1865 is like the European Union. And the federal constitution has limited reach. And so uh, if you look at the right to be free of uh, illegal search and seizure, well, first of all, if you lived, lived in a slave cabin, you had no right to keep the slave master out of the slave cabin if they wanted to barge in. I mean, hello, th this should be obvious. And the fact that people either don't think about these issues or they think falsely and correctly about these issues helps to explain why we're in such a deep hole, why you had on January 6th an attempt to violently prevent the transfer of power from one bourgeois administration to another bourgeois administration, and why it is that the so-called European allies of the United States as represented by Mr. Biden's trip to Europe just a few weeks ago they're all hedging like crazy. I mean, they must be studying lessons from hedge fund billionaires in terms of how to hedge, because as they survey the landscape, they fully anticipate a return of the Trumpistas in November 2022, and certainly by November 2024. And if that case, then that case, of course, is Katie bar the door in terms of the further shriveling of democratic rights. And by the way, whatever democratic rights that we enjoy in North America, please do not give credit to these wig wearing, tight pants wearing, so-called founding fathers. Uh, that is to say that the rights we enjoy, we took over their objection. In fact, you can make an argument that some of the recent decisions of the US Supreme Court uh, circumscribing, circumscribing the right to vote, for example, the recent decision on Thursday, which gutted the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and its companion decision, which is the evil twin of the Citizens United case of a decade ago, which will allow a tsunami of dark money uh, to flood into elections without any fingerprints on it. You can make an argument that the Supreme Court, in some ways, they're as they say, they're going back to the original understanding. You should take them seriously <laughs> of the Constitution, which did not necessarily include people like myself. And the sooner that our so-called left-wing friends wake up and smell the ink on the parchment of this overrated document, the better off we'll be. 
Which brings me to another point, which is that every rebellion against British rule is not necessarily a step forward for humanity. Look at Rhodesia, November 1965, when the Rhodesian Front, a runaway white supremacist regime, sought to emulate apartheid South Africa by breaking away from London's rule. This is today Zimbabwe, uh, because London, they thought, was moving to one person, one vote, jeopardizing white supremacy. And of course, Ian Smith, the leader of the Rhodesian Front, as I said in my book on Zimbabwe, he thought he was walking in the footsteps of 1776. He said as much, in fact. And if you look at Algeria, for example, when the French settlers in the 1950s began to revolt as they thought France was about to pull the plug on the settler colonial enterprise, they even went so far as to try to assassinate Charles de Gaulle. Uh, was that a step forward for humanity? The fact that you're trying to prevent African majority rule? So once again, I think that these theses of these people who are prattling and prating about issues that they know little or nothing about really need to be called to account. And minimally, they should ask the question, why is it that we're sitting here in North America speaking English in light of the fact, as I said, and as you already know, Spain had the first mover's advantage. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Let's, Let's move, move to, to the, the... Um, founding fathers. So this is, this part, is part of the terrain, stuff. I feel, where a lot of those on the left, they, they want to protect and defend the founding fathers as these revolutionary figures. But you have done a lot of history on this. I know a bit, but I know you've done a lot more in terms of who exactly were George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson. All of them owned slaves. All of them were slave owners. Uh, you've mentioned that George Washington was a land speculator. So the proclamation of 1763 was uh, a very deep annoyance to him uh, in that he wanted westward land. He wanted to expropriate more indigenous land. Could you talk about who these folks were and why it's important to understand their class character and what they represented as the so-called representatives of this quote-unquote American Revolution? Well, if you understand their class character, you may be able to understand their class project. You may be able to understand that the United States of America, which eventuates from their successful revolt against British rule, which, by the way, would not have been successful, but for French intervention on the side of the settlers, as France was seeking to settle scores with this longtime antagonist across the channel, uh, speaking of London. And indeed, it backfired since France had to go into debt in order to uh, satisfy the voracious claims of these while spenders, spending settlers, and going into debt then caused them to try to wring more free labor out of the enslaved in the Caribbean, which leads directly to the Haitian Revolution, which is the true revolution uh, of this era in which we're discussing. And interestingly enough, even some of the most so-called advanced of these settlers, they were not in favor of the Haitian Revolution. In fact, in my book, Confronting Black Jacobins, I start with talking about George Washington's pained reaction in September 1791 to the early news that the Africans were on the march in the Caribbean. Now, wouldn't you think that these so-called revolutionaries would welcome another revolution? It's interesting. The historians have now done what Washington at all didn't do. They've thrown a blanket over 1776 and the Haitian Revolution, all calling it all the age of revolution. Well, it's very curious that one set of so-called revolutionaries, speaking of those in North America, were hotly opposed to the true revolutionaries in the Caribbean. And I think this has something to do with their class character, as noted. Many of them benefited handsomely from enslavement of Africans. Thomas Jefferson, in the first instance, because he, of course, has been exposed as hypocrite number one insofar as he was not only a beneficiary 
of enslavement of Africans, but then had the audacity, temerity, perhaps criminal intent to impregnate one of his slaves who was apparently a teenager. He could be called a child molester, for example. And th this is outrageous that people who call themselves feminists even would throw bouquets at the foot feet of a Thomas Jefferson. So these were a bunch of lying, murdering, enslaving hypocrites who deserve no respect. And with once again, with regard to these vaunted rights that we're supposed to celebrate, number one, as I said, it didn't apply to people like me. It's like uh, going to apartheid South Africa. You see this panoply of rights that apply to the European minority. And you say, oh, that forms a template for the African majority. And so rather than the folks, the black majority in South Africa taking up arms, they should wait for the logic of history to exert itself, where the rights extended to the Europeans inevitably, ineluctab ineluctably, magically, somehow is extended to the black population. Well, that's the kind of magical thinking that we are subjected to here in North America. That is to say, this limited panoply of rights, which is unclear if it, it, it really extended to anyone beyond Washington, D.C. in any case, but let's assume, without saying the reality, let's assume that it did extend beyond Washington, D.C. Well, it only extended to a, to a narrow uh, minority uh, in this so-called United States of America. So if we were to make progress, it seems to me that a top priority should be gaining and seizing a firm grip on history because right now, it seems to me that the historians remind me of the poorly trained doctor. You go to a doctor, the doctor takes a medical history, you tell the doctor about the maladies of your mother and father, their mother and father, their mother and father, and then you await the diagnosis based upon the medical history. And the doctor says, uh, well, no, I'm only interested in history for history's sake, uh, uh, not in terms of how it's going to make you better. But that's how these bourgeois historians use history. They don't, by their own admission, they do not try to use history as a way to inform the present. That was one of their chief objections to the 1619 project. It wasn't just that Nicole Hannah-Jones, the architect, had the audacity to suggest that uh, 1776, a revolt spearheaded by slave owners, may have had something to do with slavery, believe it or not. It was also the fact that she sought to connect the terrible, atrocious conditions that many of my people face today with slavery. And it seems to me that if you're going to explain the disproportionate imprisonment rate of Black Americans, the fact that we're disproportionately suspended from schools as children, you're either going to say that there must be something wrong with these people, they're a problem people, or there's something wrong with the society. And of course, when we try to point to the latter, that leads to this plethora of cascading legislation against so-called critical race theory, which many of these legislators wouldn't know if it smacked them in the face, um, which basically seeks to circumscribe the accurate and true history of indigenous dispossession and genocide and mass enslavement of Africans. The state of Texas, of course, has been in the forefront of this. And you may have heard that these mainstream liberal writers just wrote this book, Forget the Alamo, where they tried to suggest that Texas seceding from Mexico in 1836 has a lot to do with Mexico abolishing slavery in 1829 under president of African descent, Vicente Guerrero. Recall my point a few moments ago about Catholicism and religion being a qualification for settlement and England moves to race. 
So therefore you don't get the first black president until the 21st century. So Texas, Sam Houston, Stephen F. Austin, Davy Crockett, William Travis, Jim Bowie, these other uh, cutthroats and freebooters, rather than accede to abolition, they secede. Just like, for example, rather than secede, rather than uh, uh, accede to what was thought to be abolition in the 1770s, there was a secession. And just like there was a secession in 1861 uh, by the Confederate States of America, that fortunately was squashed. And that's one of the reasons why Texas is sort of in the forefront. I strike sort of. It is in the forefront. It is in the vanguard of reactionary politics because it's basically the United States square. The United States is built on a foundation of slavery and anti-abolition. Texas is built upon that same foundation, except it goes one better. Because after 1836, you see Texas continually trying to seize Mexican territory. Uh, in fact, you could probably make an argument that they have not given up to this very day. Yeah, yeah. No, I, no, I, and that's why, and that's it's, so why it's so important, important to talk about settler colonialism. Uh, I, I think that's such a critical part of this whole entire question, and, and, and so many are avoiding it. I just want to read a quote, if I may, from your um, against what uh, left wing white nationalism, because it, it, the conclusion of it, I think I want to get into in more detail, if you would. But you say that African Americans in particular sliced neatly the Gordian knot of oppression historically by forging alliances beyond the confines of settler colonialism with ties to the indigenous antebellum Florida or Haiti post-1804 or London 1776 to 1865 or Tokyo pre-1945 or Moscow point post-1917 or independent Africa and the Caribbean point post-1960. What does this mean for today? It means rejecting the new Cold War against Russians and Chinese, instead forging alliances with both. It means linking demands for reparations nationally with like-minded struggles in the Caribbean and Africa. It means realizing that the uncanny ability of some on the U.S. left to hand rhetorical weapons to the right bash to bash the oppressed, from political correctness to cancel culture, is hardly coincidence or accident, but simply another expression of a cross-class alliance that has propped up settler colonialism from its inception. So I'll stop there because I want to ask you if you could talk about some of these historical examples you cite because it's so important on this July 4th to put at the forefront resistance and struggle against the very foundations of the United States. And Black people in the United States have always been really the leaders of that. I don't think wherever the left goes in the United States, it's always where the black left is leading them, where black people are leading them. that That is just the history of the United States. So could you speak to some of these examples you cite? And if you could just talk about resistance to these this origins myth, which I think is the, the myth, the very foundation of American exceptionalism itself. Well, if you start with the Spanish invasion of um, this continent, as I said in my 16th century book, as early as the 1520s, the Spanish from their perch in Santo Domingo had brought enslaved Africans to what is now South Carolina in order to establish a settlement. But the Africans revolted, defected to the indigenous side, and then chased the Spanish back to the Caribbean, which of course opens the door ultimately for the English to arrive in 1607. I've already made reference to these indigenous African alliances in Florida, uh, post the formation of St. Augustine in 1565, uh, which of course extends throughout the uh, 19th century. Uh, you're probably familiar, uh, not only with what you alluded to a moment ago, uh, which is Stono's revolt in South Carolina, 1739, when Africans in Spanish military uniforms come into South Carolina from their perch in Florida. The United States does not take over Florida until about 200 years ago and help to stir up the Africans and help to stir up the bloodiest slave revolt of colonial North America. And of course, many of the Africans in both South Carolina and Florida 
were Angolans, Southwest Africa, former Portuguese colony. Many of them spoke Portuguese. Many of them were Roman Catholics, so they had that in common. And then fast forwarding to the 19th century, many of your audience are probably familiar with the wars that gripped the U.S. takeover 200 years ago up until the 1850s. Oftentimes it's suggested that the war in Afghanistan is the longest conflict the United States has been involved in. Well, actually the wars in Florida uh, last much longer than that 20 year episode from 2001, presumably to 2021. And in fact, there was a de facto merger of the people we call the Seminoles and the Africans. In fact, some of the settlers said that what they were facing was not an Indian war, but a, a Negro war. And reeling back to the 1500s in the Caribbean, uh, you see that there were certain French forces who in order to steal a march on their European competitors were willing to ally with Africans to oust the Spanish from the Caribbean, for example. Indeed, I think it's fair to say, as I say in my 16th century book, that when the English wound up triumphing, including their revolting offspring post 1776, that that was the worst of all possible worlds for the indigenous and the Africans because the English mantra, as we know, was the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Whereas as bad and as horrible as the French were as colonists and even as the Spanish were as colonists, the English were probably the worst of all. So we got the worst of all worlds. And I think it's also fair to say that this relationship with the indigenous population is one of the major themes of uh, the early history of the United States of America. And I should also say that the relationship with the Mexican population is one of the central themes of the early history of the United States. Uh, that is to say that one of the points of conflict between the settlers here and Mexico was that Mexico would not return enslaved Africans who fled south of the border. Uh, this was a major property and capital loss on the part of the enslavers, which inflamed their ire and made them want to liquidate Mexican sovereignty altogether. Uh, in that article you quoted from, you made reference to the 20th century alliances, uh, post-1917 Russian Revolution, even the alliance with uh, Japan on the part of black nationalists that I wrote an entire book about. Uh, so that is one of the reasons we have been able to escape the horror and the terror that these settlers had in store for us. Because I think you have to realize that the African presence in North America precedes the English presence, as I've already explained. And you should also know that there was a battle royal as to who would wind up prevailing in North America. This multiracial alliance that involved indigenous and Africans in the first instance, and the white united front, if you like, that still prevails today, I'm afraid to say. And sadly and tragically, it's the latter that prevailed, and which now leaves us with, as I said in that article you just so kindly quoted from, leading us to confront not only the right-wing white nationalists uh, who are bang for blood, who have a knife in their teeth, who are willing to seize power by any means necessary, and their left-wing apologists, who I'm afraid to say, if they're not careful, they'll wind up being liquidated too. Yeah, it's, it's so true. It, when you make these alliances and you talk about white supremacy, whiteness as being a cross-class alliance um, that allows for the reproduction of settler colonialism and the continuation of the uh, racist slave system. And of course, that cross-class alliance continues into this day. And it's uh, and it infects, it really does infect even the so-called most progressive among the white left. And that is a very important thing for us to talk about 
on this day because we have had now countless movements from Occupy Wall Street to the uprisings against racist policing led by the uh, movement for Black Lives and everyone under the banner of it. And we've had Bernie Sanders and the social democratic kind of movement towards wanting things, even just the desire for things like universal health care. And if we don't talk about racism, if we don't talk about white supremacy and we don't uh, connect it to these struggles, uh, what ends up happening, I think what has actually happened is that the, the ground is seeded for the actual ruling class and white supremacy to defeat these movements or at least arrest them to the point of not affecting the kind of change we want to see. Talk to us about how important it, the the Black movement has been, because you have written a lot about this, the Black movement in the United States, the movement, um, whether it was the rebellions against slavery or whether it was uh, the, uh, whether it's re Reconstruction, whether it was uh, the struggle against Jim Crow. Tell me how these movements have shaped the any kind of progress that have happened that has happened in the United States because a lot of times this assumption I think this kind of whole uh, try, this attempt to hold on to the founding fathers and what they represent tells a story of the United States it tells a story that if we just sit around and let history let the makers of history do their thing then things will get better right and you said earlier on in this conversation don't you dare credit the founding fathers with any kind of progressive change well I think the the idea that this country just becomes more and more progressive, improves more and more as it makes these mistakes, I think tells a particular story of the United States and it erases the struggle of black people. It erases that liberation movement. It erases all of its different iterations and, and the forms that it took. So could you talk about what is the role of the black liberation movement? What is the role of black people in the, the progress that has been made globally and domestically, um, if, you, if, you, if you would. It's a big question, but I thought I would ask it. Well, to tackle your previous point first, that is to say there's this mythos that somehow progress is inevitable in this country. The expansion of democratic rights is inevitable, which is very demobilizing because if it's inevitable, well, maybe we don't even have to struggle for it. And what this elides is that the expansion of rights has been met with fierce resistance. For example, if you look at Little Rock, Arkansas, 1957, the attempt to gain edu education equity for black youth uh, who were spat upon the Eisenhower administration under international pressure, key international pressure, had to send armed guards into Central High School to keep black students from being mauled and subjected to mayhem, there was fierce resistance. Uh, to quote the late, already forgotten Donald Rumsfeld, uh, these were not dead enders in Little Rock. These, this was the cream of the crop of the Little Rock, Arkansas, Euro-American working class and middle class that was stoutly opposed to education equity they felt they had reason to believe that this was leading to a devaluation of the currency that was whiteness, that it would not have as much purchasing power, and therefore they were struggling to keep that current valuation. This was not unique to Little Rock. You saw a similar struggle in Oxford, Mississippi, 1962, when James Meredith, a lone black student, seeks to desegregate Ole Miss, University of Mississippi in Oxford, Mississippi, the home of William Faulkner, the celebrated novelist, amongst others. Of course, once again, there had to be uh, soldiers on campus to protect them from being torn from limb to limb. Uh, there was first resistance in Boston, once again, over the question of education equity in the 1970s. Look at the prize-winning photograph from Boston this Euro-American man wielding a U.S. flag against this black man in a three-piece suit, using it as a spear to try to decapitate him. There was fierce resistance in Yonkers, New York in the 1980s with regard to housing desegregation. So what helps to push victory across the finish line for us 
once again, it's what I highlighted a moment ago, international pressure. The right wing and their acolytes feel that the moment has now arrived for them to turn the tables and to push us all the way back, not only before 1954, but heaven for Finn, uh, well, before the 20th century even. And speaking of before the 20th century, if you look at the constitutional amendments that come out of the US Civil War, uh, for example, the 14th Amendment guaranteeing equal protection under the law, uh, designed to protect the rights of black people, ultimately, of course, it's used to help to substantiate everything from gender equality to marriage equality, uh, for example. If you look at the 15th Amendment and the struggle around the right to vote and its progeny, which had included the Voting Rights Act of 1965, it had been used also to make sure that there were bilingual ballots in San Francisco and in San Antonio, Texas, for example. So that illustrates your point about how this Black struggle uh, was in many ways a struggle on behalf of working class people. And you see this as well with the Juneteenth holiday. Now, I have a, a critique of the history of Juneteenth. This is a subject I've happened to study. It'll be one of my forthcoming books. But at the end of the day, it's unavoidable that this paid holiday will not only be paid holiday for black workers, it'll be paid holiday for all workers. What's the last paid federal holiday? Martin Luther King Day, 1983. So once again, this being able to work, not work and be compensated, which is what a holiday is, that's a gift from us to the class, to the working class. And this is an example as well of trade union struggles. Uh, that is to say, I wrote a book about Ferdinand Smith, who was the number two leader and one of the most important unions in the United States of America, the National Maritime Union, uh, which had a stranglehold because of its workers on vessels, a stranglehold on exports and imports. And of course, he was black, Jamaican origin. Uh, as the Red Scare attains liftoff, uh, he sent back to his native Jamaica the living conditions and the way, workers and wage, wages and working conditions for sailors plummet to the point now where U.S. vessels are basically floating slums and the victories gained by that union have gone down the drain to a large extent. But that helps to illustrate this pivotal role of black workers in particular whose many struggles have benefited the entire working class. Thank you. That was great. Um, incredible history that, that everyone needs to know, I think. And I want to pivot because we have about 10 minutes, 15 minutes left. Um, and I want to pivot to this point that I hear a lot. And I think you make a lot of good arguments mm -hmm. to counter it that we need more unity between the left and the right, right? We need to be, um, we can't be calling everyone racist, right? And it drives me crazy sometimes because what I think is being said is that we need to ignore the roots of the United States and the fact that they continue to play out in the things that you mentioned earlier, the fact that, uh, you know, black people make up a large portion of the uh, prison population, dispropor incredibly disproportionate number of black people killed by police. Uh, black wealth is zero, even though white Americans are not doing too well right now either, right? 40% of our asset poor, uh, uh, black wealth in the United States is trending towards zero. And there's no way you can separate the roots of the United States and the ongoing legacy and continuation of white supremacy with that fact. So if you could just talk about what, how we should counter this idea that we need to unify, even with forces that consider themselves racist, because I know the struggle, you know, I'm from Boston myself, and you mentioned the 1970, you know, 74, the, the, 
struggle, the racist reaction to busing and desegregation. You know, the, Boston was one of the last cities in the country to desegregate. And I know people who are in that struggle who, and, and I can tell you that a lot of working class whites were a part of that racist reaction in South Boston, et cetera. And that, that trend continues into this day and we have to cope with it. We cannot avoid the fact that a lot of our working class brothers, sisters, uh, people uh, of the white persuasion do harbor racist attitudes. And not only do they harbor racist attitudes, but they can be mobilized, as we saw with en these endless wars in the U.S.'s expression of empire. White Americans of all classes tend to be the most supportive of imperialist aggression, regardless of the intervention we talk about, whether it's now the new Cold War, Russia, China, or Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, all of that. There's a reason why that is. So could you talk about how we should react, how we should approach this question when we are told, when we are, when it is suggested that we all need to rally, uni unify around what we agree with, uh, without kind of talking about these quote unquote culture wars. I see this word thrown about by some on the progressive, so-called progressive left, some on the so-called, uh, you know, right wing. So how, how should we react to this? Let's close on this though, because I think this is a, is a, a really deep, a big question. Well, unite around what issue? I mean, that, that's the question. I mean, if it's uniting around waging, raising wages and improving working conditions, of course, let's unite. But if it's uniting around throwing women's reproductive rights overboard, well, no, we're not going to unite. So it depends on what we're uniting for. And once again, I think history is a very useful explainer because if we really understood settler colonialism, and if you really look at my book on the 16th century, you'll realize that when England sends the settlers over in their first failed enterprise in the 1580s into what is now North Carolina, that this is a class collaborationist effort. Settler colonialism is the flip side of class collaboration. Class collaboration is the flip side of settler colonialism. So we should not be shocked and surprised by the 75 million votes that Donald J. Trump receives in November 2020. We should not be surprised that one of the few barrels, if not the only barrel in New York City that he wins is Staten Island, which is a citadel of the Euro-American working class and middle class. And to suggest that we should unite with the right in some sort of red-brown coalition or red-brown-black coalition, I mean, they must think that we're into suicide. And I have a, a, a secret to share with you. We're not. So you need to come up with a new strategy and a new idea. And speaking of which, I think that when you do come up with those new strategies and new ideas, it would be good to look beyond the four corners in the United States of America. For example, if you look at my book on Southern Africa, one of the things you'll find is that when apartheid was implanted at the southern tip of Africa post-August 1948, it was designed in part by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, and it was designed in part as once again to uplift the Afrikaner poor. The Afrikaner are the descendants of the original Dutch and French Protestant settlers because it was felt that if they were not uplifted, that they might align with the African poor. And so it was designed to uplift them as a method to subvert class struggle. And understanding the subversion of class struggle in Southern Africa also may help you to understand the subversion of class struggle here in the United States of America. So uh, I, I find it hard to believe, I guess I must be out of touch, that there are forces who are suggesting that we make alliances with Trump supporters uh, it's almost like saying that you, you study the history of lynching, these extrajudicial executions of Black people in particular, uh, which 
leads to thousands of deaths between post-1865 up through the 1950s. Interestingly enough, these were mobs. And I guess you could say that this is one uh, aspect of U.S. culture where, in a sense, the state, speaking of police forces, have replaced the private sector. That is to say, these mobs in terms of executing black people. But what's interesting, if you look at these 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 uh, lynch mobs, they're oftentimes comprised of Euro American working class people and middle class people. And so, I don't know how you unite with your lynchers. Uh, would you say, uh, where do I put my neck on the guillotine, sir? I mean, come on, this makes no sense. And so, I think that these people you're referring to, they need to get their head out of the clouds or perhaps get their head out of a sensitive part of their anatomy and think more clearly about the correlation of forces, about class forces, about the international situation, because unless and until they do, I'm afraid to say we're always going to be on the brink of catastrophe. Yes, uh, yes, indeed. Well, you all heard it all from Ger from Dr. Gerald Horn. Uh, I think that's a great way to end our uh, conversation. Uh, Dr. Horn, thank you so much for coming on. Um, it was it was really a pleasure. You know, your work is so prolific, and and you're always writing. So I appreciate that as someone who's always trying to write and always writing myself. I think it's just very inspirational that you continue to produce this kind of work, which I think is so critical to, to get at the origins of these questions. And you write about so many different facets of uh, the Black historical experience. Uh, so just check out Dr. Horn's work. And, and I, do you have any uh, closing words before I let you go? Well, uh, only that, once again, we're, we're in deep trouble right now. Uh, as I said, the right wing is on the march. Um, you should not see January 6th as an aberration or some sort of accident. I'm afraid to say it's a foretaste of things to come unless and until we are able to get a more accurate reading of the troubled history of this land, which on this July 4th, 2021, minimally should include a more accurate and in-depth understanding of how a slaveholder's republic was formed post-1776, which then morphed into an apartheid regime and then has left us with the wreckage that we're sifting through today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Horn. Again, that, this was great. 